All right, let's begin. I'm going to read for us the first two chapters of Galatians, and then we'll have a, a little discussion and ask some questions. So Galatians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. But I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born, who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to Cephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. And what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia and was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They were only hearing it said, He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. Then, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles, in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission, even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seemed influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the, excuse me, though just as I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all. Now, I'm going to stop here for just a moment. I want to just point out this quote, I believe, goes to the end of chapter 2. Your ESV and most translations will put the quote at the end of, of this verse. In Greek, 
there are no end quotation marks. So it's up to context to decide. So I believe this entire rest of the chapter is Paul's response to Peter, to Cephas. So beginning again, he says, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is justified by works of the law, uh, not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. All right, so before we jump into this section, and I hope that you perceive why I read this entire section, because you see that Paul is giving a history, so to speak, right? History of his conversion, a history of the interactions that he had with the Jewish leaders, with the other apostles and such. And as you can see, he's kind of giving a defense of his ministry, and we're going to get into that tonight. But before we do, just a couple of questions. Uh, We began with some of these last week, and just by way of rehearsal, I'm not going to call anybody by name, so don't panic. What is our goal, and what is Paul's goal for us in the book of Galatians? He writes this letter to a particular people, but it applies to us. What was his goal for us? That by the end of this letter, through our time, we would arrive somewhere. Anybody remember? I'm the best grade. Yep, take a look at... 6.14. 6.14. So I'm probably going to ask these questions several weeks in a row. So if you don't get it this week, we'll get it at some point, okay? So 6.14, Paul says, But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is Paul's purpose in writing. That's his hope for us, that our boast would only be Jesus Christ and his cross. Now, why is he writing this book? Well, there's a circumstance going on in the church in Galatia. There are people who have come in and who are preaching a false gospel. They're actually adding to the gospel. They're preaching that you have to be circumcised in order to be saved. So it's not enough just to be be in Christ, not enough to just have faith in Christ. You have to keep the law, and circumcision is really just kind of a summary form, a way of signaling that these people said you had to keep the whole law. Right? It's not just simply circumcision. You would have to keep the dietary restrictions and observe certain feast days and things like that. But he says you are accepting this other gospel, not that there really is one. Right? So look at chapter 1, verse 6. This is the occasion, what's going on in the Galatian church that prompted Paul to write to them. He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. There are these false teachers. They're distorting the gospel. They're troubling you, troubling your conscience by adding the law to the work of Christ. And when you add the law to the work of Christ, if you add anything to Christ, you end up losing Christ. Okay? You end up losing Christ. I say that because look at chapter 5, verse 2. Paul's going to explain for us the seriousness, the significance of deserting Christ or seeking to add something to Christ. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. Friends, this could not be more serious. And I began last week by asking a very simple question. The question is, what is at the heart or the root of our wrong beliefs? When we have wrong beliefs. Gospel unbelief. 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 Very good. Okay. Unbelief. Sometimes we have ignorance. Sometimes there's things we just don't know. 
But generally speaking, especially for those of us who are in a healthy church, who have been in that church for any length of time, who have sat under sound teaching and preaching, right, or been discipled by mature saints, mature brothers and sisters in the church, we have, we have good doctrine, right? We have a right understanding of the gospel. But there are still pockets of our lives where we are marked with wrong belief, but that wrong belief is really, it's unbelief. It's gospel unbelief. What do I mean? Well, for instance, when you add the law to the gospel, if you add anything to the work of Christ, or you even just doubt the work of Christ is sufficient to save you, if you have thoughts of, well, you know, how, man, the way that I lived today and sinned, and maybe I was short of my children or my wife or in my workplace, I, you know, I didn't do X, Y, Z. How could God be pleased with me? Can he really look upon me with pleasure and delight as his child in light of who I am? We have those sorts of doubts. That's gospel unbelief. It's a distorted <laughs> gospel that we're clinging to. We're adding something of our works to the gospel. And Paul says if we do that ultimately, if fully and finally we continue down that road, you'll be severed from Christ. Of course, he's not saying that you can lose your salvation. When we get to that text, we'll make that very plain. He's not saying you can lose your salvation. You're in Christ. You will be preserved by the Father. But you may prove that you just never really had been united to Christ in the first place. So with that, I brought up last week the fact that we can read a book like this. We can read it and go, well, man, no, I'm not trying to add circumcision to my faith. I'm not trying to add some extrinsic law keeping, not explicitly. What does this book really have to do with me? It doesn't seem like it has a lot to say to me. Maybe we get to, you know, we get to chapter 6 and we get a couple commands in there, right? We get a few commands and that tells us what to do as Christians. That part applies. But what about all this stuff about the gospel being distorted and deserting the gospel and deserting Christ? I haven't done that. Well, stay tuned. We're going to find, as is the case in all the scriptures, all the scriptures are relevant to all Christians at all times at all places. And so when you read in here and you read some of the the details about what the church in Galatia was tempted into, and also we're going to read what Peter did and what Barnabas did forsaking Christ and denying him, essentially. These are all things that we do. We do these things. And it may be hard to see, but by God's grace, we're going to start to see some of these things. And we say, why are we going to do that? It's painful. It's not fun, right? It's not fun to look in the mirror and see what you are, right, in and of yourself. It's not fun. Why would we do that to ourselves? Why would I do that? You know, you're fine people. It's not, I'm, I'm not here to beat you up or to hurt your feelings or to make you feel bad about yourselves. Why would we do that? We talked about there are three uses of the law that the church has understood historically. And those three uses very simply are to reveal God's holiness and how far we fall short of his righteous standard. As the law reveals God's standard, it shows us how far we fall short and therefore our need for a savior. And so the law is designed to drive us to see our need. The second use is the civil use. It just restrains evil in the world and in us. Think of a speed limit. You don't speed. Maybe you just don't have a lead foot, but those of us who like to drive a little faster, why don't we speed? I don't want a ticket. I don't want my insurance going up, right? There's consequences. So the law gives consequences and threatens punishments and such, and it hems us in and restrains some evil in us and the world. And the third is that the law is designed to instruct us about what sort of life pleases God. Those are the three uses of the law. This isn't new information. This is, goes back all the way to the Reformation and before. But I ask the question, which of those three uses is the most essential? What is the special use of the law in the life of believers? First one, I think the first one. And you may be tempted, especially depending on what baggage you bring in from churches you've been a part of, you may be tempted to think it's that third use. It's, well, I just need to be, I'm in Christ now. I'm a new creation. I have the Holy Spirit dwelling in me. I just need to be told what to do now. What does the law say I should do? How can I live to please God? And that's absolutely a use. It's absolutely necessary in the life of the believer. But the first use is the primary. It's the special use. The Westminster Larger Catechism, question 97, asks, what is the special use of the law in the life of believers? And it says the first use, that through the law, holding up for us a mirror to reveal who we are still in our flesh and our need for Christ, it reveals how bound we are to Christ for two things, his having kept the law for us in our place and being our righteousness and having suffered the penalty of the law in our place. Because as it reveals that to us, what's going to happen? We're going to love Christ, right? 
Luke 7, 47 says, He who's been forgiven much loves much. When you see how much you've been forgiven, you grow in knowledge of how much you've been forgiven in Christ, you will love him more. And those who love Christ, he says in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. He doesn't say, if you love me, prove it. Go obey my commandments. No, he says, you will. It's just matter of fact. You will. It's what the believer naturally does. When you have a sight of Christ as a beautiful Savior, what the believer naturally does with that sight of Christ, he loves Christ and he obeys him. It's what we do. So if we have an obedience problem, we have a love problem. If we have a love problem, it's because you're not seeing yourself clearly in the law of God. So I start with all that because I and Paul are desperate for us not to close our eyes and stop our ears to what God's law has to say to us. It's painful at times. We don't like it. We like our own glory. We're going to see that again this morning, this morning, this evening, right? Sorry. I teach Hebrews in the morning. <laughs> so we want to stop our ears to it. And if we do that, brothers and sisters, if you stop your ears to what the law says about you, you're going to water it down, neuter it of its strength, and it's not going to accomplish what God designed it to accomplish in your lives, which is to show you Christ, to drive you to Him. Okay, a lot of introduction. Let's jump right into the text here. As I said, Paul is going to defend his ministry. We're going to begin here really at verse 1. Verse 1, Paul says, Paul, an apostle. And immediately he jumps into, he's already defending his ministry. It's kind of preemptively. If you compare this greeting with some of his other greetings, you see it's like he's really just putting it out there. He says, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me. And then he says in verse 4, speaking of Christ who's been given by the Father for our sins, he says he gave himself for our sins, to do what? To deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of a God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And this present evil age that he's talking about is not just merely all the sin going into the world. I mean, we can look at our time right now and be like, man, we are in a present evil age. But this present evil age, even beyond that, in this context is this overlapping of the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, this overlapping of the Jewish system of things and the law and the gospel, the Old Covenant, New Covenant. And in this age, we have people who are actively opposing the proclamation of the gospel, who are seeking to distort it, he says. And that's Paul's main concern. So we've seen this section here where he talks about them distorting the gospel in ver- beginning at verse 6. But now look at what he says in verse 10. Verse 10, he says, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. So, the rest of this section, all the way through the end of chapter 2, Paul is going to defend that statement. He says, I'm not trying to please man. Okay, If I were, I wouldn't be preaching the gospel. Why? Well, because he says that the cross is an offense okay, in chapter 5, and he says, you know, he's being persecuted because he preaches the gospel. The way he preaches the gospel is bringing persecution to him. Well, he says, I'm not seeking the approval of man or of God. I'm not trying to please man. If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. I wouldn't be a slave of Christ. And Paul identifies himself here as an apostle of Christ, as a servant of Christ, a bond servant of Christ. And we might think, well, okay, I'm not an apostle, right? None of us in here are apostles. Sorry if you didn't know that, you know. We're not apostles. That office has ceased in the early church. And really, few of us are teachers. We have different vocations in this room. We have adults. We have children, right? Some of us work in the home, outside of the home. We have all different walks of life. But none of us are an apostle. So can we say verse 10 ourselves? Is there a sense in which we can say, We're seeking the approval of man or of God. Can we answer that question as it relates to the gospel? And friends, what I want to tell you this evening is that, yes, inside of us, we talked about this last week, inside of us there is a principle called indwelling sin. Paul calls it the flesh. He calls it the old man. That old man seeks for glory. Seeks for glory. Because we asked last week, what's the offense of the cross? What did we say? What's the offense of the cross? We have nothing to do with it. Right. 
nothing to do with it, right? We have nothing to add to it. There's no boast for me, right? Why? Because in the cross, I'm admitting when I come to Christ by faith, it required the death of the Son of God to pay for my sin, to reconcile me to the Father, and bring peace between me and a holy God. There's nothing I can do, nothing I can add. I can't add to it. I can't take away from it. It's a total, perfect work of salvation. In fact, the men, we've been looking at Hebrews, and multiple times we see this idea that God has made in bringing many sons to glory, which is what God's doing in the world through redemptive history. He's bringing us to glory ultimately. Well, what did he have to do first? He had to make the founder and perfecter of our faith perfect through suffering. You think, well, how did Jesus need to be made perfect? Like he's morally perfect. He had no sin. Yeah, but he had to be made the perfect Savior. He had to be made fit and the perfect Savior for our case to meet our need. And so he had to suffer in order to be made a sympathetic high priest. That's what God is doing in the world. He's bringing many sons to glory. But for us, we don't like that in our flesh, I'm speaking, right? As new creations, new creatures in Christ, you love the gospel. But listen, brothers and sisters, there's still a flesh that dwells in you, still indwelling sin, and it hates the gospel. It's an offense. The cross is an offense to your old man. Why? Because there's no boast in it for you. And so when Paul says, am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Am I trying to please man? He's saying, what am I preaching? Am I preaching a message that men approve of, that pleases man, or one that pleases God? And the question we have to ask ourselves is, what are we preaching? And I'm not talking about on street corners. I'm not talking about evangelism. I'm not talking about behind a pulpit. What do we preach to ourselves? Mm -hmm. What do you preach to one another, to your spouse, to your children, right? What kind of message are you believing? Are you preaching to yourself a message that pleases man, meaning the man in the mirror, the old man, that man that's dead in sin? Is that who you're pleasing? Or are you seeking to please God? Well, Paul's going to now go into this defense of his ministry. And it's kind of odd at first. There's another place where Paul does this. I don't have time to go through it, but just for your edification, uh, read 2 Corinthians chapter 11 into 12, and you'll see Paul there very passionately defends his ministry. It's quite interesting when you read it, because at the end of that, in fact, let's just look at the last verse of that defense. We won't read the whole defense, but just uh, 11, 16 to 12, 19 specifically. But look at 2 Corinthians 12. So when you see what Paul says about his uncharacteristic boasting that he does, after he goes through quite a long tirade, giving all of these accolades and all these things he can boast in, but then in 19 he says, 12, 19, have you been thinking all along that we've been defending ourselves to you? It is in the sight of God that we have been speaking in Christ and all for your upbuilding, beloved. Paul does not boast. And he says, you know, you forced me to it in 2 Corinthians. You forced me to do this. How did they force him? Because they were questioning his apostolic ministry. They were questioning whether or not he was legitimate messenger of God and therefore whether or not his message was legitimately from God. See, Paul doesn't care about his apostolic ministry and whether or not you believe him and take him to be legitimate, only insofar as he values the gospel. And so if you don't take Paul as being truly of God, then you're going to belittle the gospel he proclaims. And that's his only care, is for our good and for the glory of God in Christ. So he's going to do that here. So he begins in chapter 1, verse 11. He says, I would have you know, brothers, the gospel preached by me is not man's gospel, or literally not according to man. How so? Well, verse 12, for because I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, well, when did that happen? Flip to Acts. We're going to be in Acts quite a bit, so kind of keep your finger as we jump back and forth. Acts 7, end of Acts 7. So again, Paul is going to defend his ministry because he wants to prove he's not preaching a message that pleases man. Now, in 7, beginning at verse 54, we see this is right on the heels of Stephen having preached this beautiful sermon, and they're going to stone him. 
And so in verse 54 of chapter 7, Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, the Jews who were there, and the, particularly the Jewish leaders. They ground their teeth at him, but he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven, saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, and rushed together at him. And then they cast him out of the city, and stoned him. And notice, and the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Saul's holding their cloaks while they stone Stephen. He's holding them, standing by approvingly. Okay? We see that because then in verse 8, 1, he says, And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose that day a great persecution. Skip down to verse 3. But Paul was ravaging the church. And entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Flip over to chapter 9. Now, Paul, after this, is going to have an encounter with the risen Christ. And so, verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 1, But Paul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples and the Lord, of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at, at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, that's what they were calling the sect of Christianity at the time, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And so then as he's going on his way, he has this encounter with the risen Christ and a bright light shines and it's Jesus. And he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Right? Interesting. He says, you're persecuting me, not the church, right? Not my believers because Christ so identifies with us that he says, you're persecuting me when you do this. And then Paul has his conversion experience. Now, what's cool about this, so keep your finger here because we're going to come right back to it, but we want to continue down in Galatians. So, so far, chapter 1, verse 12, he says he didn't receive this from anyone. It was taught it by anyone. He received it through a revelation of Christ. We just saw that. And he explains in verse 13, You have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. We just read that. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people, which is the fact that he was holding the cloaks and not doing the stoning is evidence of that, right? He was standing there approvingly. They're looking to him. Listen, you hold our coats. You supervise this whole situation, okay? So he's advancing beyond those of his own age. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me, in order that I might preach among, among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. So flip back to Acts 9 again. So in Acts 9, Paul, then he goes to Ananias, who the Lord had come to him in a vision and said, listen, this guy Saul's going to come and he's a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles. So, you know, take care of him, etc." And he goes to him, and these scales fall from his eyes, and he regains his sight. In verse 18, it says, He arose and was baptized, taking food. He was strengthened. Now, look at what we're told. The second half of 19. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. All who heard him were amazed and said, Is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? I mean, literally, that's why Paul was there, right? You came with letters to say, I'm, anybody who's a Christian, who's a, in the way, I'm going to bring back to Jerusalem in handcuffs, in fetters. So he says, but Paul, verse 22, increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But the plot became known to Saul. So they were watching the gates by night in order to kill him. But the disciples, his disciples took him by night, let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him. But they did not believe he was a disciple. So they're basically thinking that he's trying to fool them, like, oh, hey, I'm a disciple now. Come on out, you know, and then clap them in irons and lead them off, right? But Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles, and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who had spoke to him, and how at Damascus he preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So we went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against, about, against the Hellenists. Those are the Greek-speaking Jews. But they were seeking to kill him, 
And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Okay, back to Galatians. So Paul is recounting all of this. Why? Because he's saying, listen, I did not, I did not receive this gospel from any man. No man taught me this gospel. I received the revelation directly from the Lord. In fact, after I got saved, after my conversion experience with the risen Christ, I didn't immediately go to anybody. It was only after three years that he went up to Jerusalem and went to Cephas, etc. But that was only 15 days. He wanted to be there longer, but persecution arose and he had to send them off so he wouldn't be killed. Now, 2 verse 1. Then, this is where it really gets glorious. After 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential. So what is he setting before them? The gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles. Now, why is he doing this after, after really 17 years, right? But 14 years particularly since he had spent 15 days in Jerusalem with Peter. 14 years later, he's, he's concerned. He says, he wants to make sure that the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles, that, it's, that he had not been running in vain or had not run in vain. Now, when he gets there, though, he says, but even Titus, who was a Greek, who was a Gentile, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. And then he tells us, but something else is going on here. We have these false teachers that were there at the time. Yet because a false brother secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission, even for a moment, so that the, why? So that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And for those who seemed influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. Now you hear that and you're like, man, this guy is full of himself. He's not. His point is, no one added anything to me. He's trying to get us to the point of understanding this is all of the supernatural hand of God through Christ and the Spirit. That's how I know the gospel. No one taught me but Christ. Now, here's the cool thing we're going to see here. I'm going to tell you before we read it, right, so we can read it and it'll make sense. Now, we've all played, probably at some point, Whisper Down the Lane, right? Is that what they call it? Telephone. Telephone. That's the other name, right? Yeah, sorry. From New Jersey, it's Whisper Down the Lane up north. Sorry. Telephone is also, yeah. I need somebody to have another name for it. Yeah, so we've all played Telephone. Now, what happens in Telephone? We all get in a line. And the teacher comes up, you know, usually in grade school they do this. They teach us a very valuable lesson. And you whisper in the one child's ear or something, and then they tell the next one, next one, next one. And eventually you get further away, and by the time you get to the end of the line, it's something so silly everybody laughs, right? Now, I want you to imagine then, what would happen if you had two lines? And you told two lines of children. You told the first one, and then you, by the time you get to the end, you're going to have totally different things. They're going to be totally different. Why? Well, the further, you notice, the further it gets away from its point of origin, from the real thing, the more preposterous it gets, the sillier it gets, right? The further it gets from the real truth of what was said. Well, it's kind of like, you know, uh, you know in, in golf, you know, if you, if you ever watch golf or play golf, you hit a drive. If you're, if you're just doing a putt and you're like one degree off, you're probably still going to make the putt if it's a short putt. You'll be, maybe you'll hit the edge of the cup and it rolls right in. You do that same one degree off on a drive 300 yards later, you're in the woods, okay? Same one degree, it's just a matter of distance. Well, here we have 14 years. Guess what? Paul receives revelation from Christ. Peter and the other apostles had, had walked with Christ and seen the risen Christ, and Peter himself had his own revelation from Christ concerning this whole issue of the Gentiles we're about to see. Both of them started completely and utterly independent of each other. It's absolutely amazing. They start independent of each other. And now 14 years later, what do we find? We're going to find their lines are running perfectly parallel with each other, and they're still in the same place. Only the power of God could do that. Only the Holy Spirit could do that. To start in two different places, but really with the same message, 14 years later, he says, I received nothing from them. They didn't add anything to me when I was there for the 15 days. Nothing. They didn't teach me a whole bunch of stuff. 14 years later, 
we find out we're running perfectly parallel. We believe the same thing. We're teaching the same gospel. We had our own independent revelation concerning the gospel going to the Gentiles in our own unique way that the, God, that, that the Lord revealed these things to us, but we're running parallel. How, could, how on earth could that be? That's Paul's point. Paul's not boasting so he can get a couple of these right at the end of the day. His seemingly, seeming uh, boast is in Christ and in his power to identify a man and say, you're mine, you're my servant who's going to proclaim the gospel and to keep him and to keep the gospel pure. And Paul, that's all that Paul lives for. Right? It's all he lives for. He says, I go through all of this. I do all of these things. Why? So that I might preserve the gospel for you. So now, let's read this section with that in our minds now. So back to 2.1. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. He went up, why? Because of a revelation that he had. He sets it before those who seem influential, the gospel that he has been preaching among the Gentiles, because he wants to make sure he had not been running or is not currently running in vain. And then he says, you know, Titus wasn't forced to be circumcised, etc. Now skip down to verse 7. On the contrary, when they saw meaning the apostles, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as in the same way Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised. And here's his, here's his little parenthetical statement. For he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry worked through mine for my ministry. You see, same Christ, same Lord, right? Same one working through both of us, totally independent of each other. But we found when we came together, running perfectly parallel. When they had seen this, verse 9, when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave me the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised, to the Jews. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. That's the first thing we have to see here, that Paul, because listen, the rest of this letter, once we get into the second half of two and beyond, this is a deep, rich, theological feast about the gospel. And we must come to this understanding who is writing and how did it come to be? Who is Paul? Not because Paul's special, right? He's not special. He says, listen, I'm the least of the apostles in his early ministry. Mid-ministry, he says, I'm the least of the saints. End of his ministry, what's he say? Chief of sinners. Chief of sinners. That's Paul's view of himself. He doesn't think he's something special. But he knows the God who has called him in his grace to proclaim the gospel, to ensure that today we have this gospel and that it has been preserved for us, preserved for us without distortion. Just imagine how how they knew, Peter knew, listen, this guy's the truth. Yes. He's not preaching something different that I preach. And I I walked with Christ. Yeah. And this guy never walked with Christ and he's still preaching the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, this is amazing, right? It's just absolutely amazing. Here you have all these other apostles, three years with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so before we go on to our conclusion for this evening from Galatians, let's now look, because we're about to introduce now what happens after this with Peter. But before we do that, let's, for the purpose of contrast, let's look at Acts 10. We need to see just how united Peter and Paul were. So we know of what happens with Peter. Peter has this vision. First Cornelius has this vision, who is a Roman centurion, and he's praying, and he has this vision that this guy Peter's going to come, and then Peter has this vision about Cornelius, and hey, you need to go to his house, next thing you know. And then Peter has a particular vision where he sees these unclean animals, and the Lord says, rise, Peter, kill, and eat. And he's like, oh, Lord, no, far be it for me to do that. I've never touched anything unclean. And he says, don't call unclean what I've called clean. And when he awakes, he realizes he's talking about the Gentiles, right? Not talking about meat. The Gentiles are clean in the sight of God. Christ has made them clean. Now, after this, look down to verse 34 of chapter 10. So Peter is explaining what just all took place with him and in Joppa with Cornelius and the whole deal and the visions and everything. So he says, verse 34, So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. 
As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened through all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him up on the third day, made him appear not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the anointed one of God, to, uh, by God, to judge the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everything, everyone, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Now, verse 44. While Peter was still saying these things, what happens? The Holy Spirit fell on all who heard. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed. Why? Because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. And then Peter says, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Christ. And they asked to remain with him for some days. So this is Peter's experience. Just as a quick aside, the Holy Spirit being given at conversion throughout the book of Acts, that's a big thing people in the Pentecostal movements will appeal to and say, oh, see, if you're, you're not saved if you don't get the, these spiritual gifts of speaking in tongues and all these other things. When the Spirit is poured out in this very tangible, visible way throughout the book of Acts, it actually is not normative. It doesn't happen every single time. It's happening when particular groups of people come to Christ. So first, we expect that Jesus is the Messiah. He's anointed one of the Jews. Well, now the question is, well, what about the Gentiles? Yep, guess what? They got the Spirit too, and with signs and miracles. And then the next group that you see is they run upon these people who were followers of John's baptism. They didn't hear about the baptism of Jesus. They didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. They didn't even know about Jesus. They just knew about John's baptism, but they were real believers. When they come to hear the gospel, what happens? They get baptized and the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and they speak in tongues and things to signal that group of people the gospels for them as well. So, a little aside there. Now, flip a few pages to Acts 15. So, some years go by. We saw already, Paul says, 14 years go by, and now he's got to go back to Jerusalem. And why does this happen? Well, we can read about it in 15 verse, well, we'll start at 5. Some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them. That's speaking of the Gentiles. It's necessary to circumcise the Gentiles in order, and order them to keep the law of Moses. Sounds familiar, right? That's what's being taught to the Galatians, I should say. The apostles, verse 6, the apostles and elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the, word of God, hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now this is just beautiful, this verse. Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples? What's a yoke? We all know what a yoke is, right? It's a harness, it's a big old wooden thing that you put on the neck, over the necks of two mules and you yoke them together so they can plow together, right? So they can pull a heavy burden behind them, a cart or whatever, right? He says, why are you putting a yoke on their neck? And look what he says about this yoke, though. He says, oh, I lost my, my place here. Thank you. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers, whose fathers? The Jews. Neither our fathers nor we ourselves have been able to bear. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And the assembly fell silent. And then they listened to Paul and Barnabas who argue, and they, Paul and Barnabas tell them everything that they've been doing, how they've been preaching the gospel, and the Gentiles are receiving the Spirit as well, etc., right? And they all come to agreement. This is Peter. You just saw Peter say this. Peter says, listen, in the early days, 14 years ago, right? So we can see the scriptures are not... They're all lining in the details. 14 years ago, in the early days, God chose me to reveal to you all that the Gentiles are heirs of faith 
heirs through faith as well of the covenant promises to Abraham, right? They don't need to be circumcised. They don't need to keep the law. How dare we put a yoke on them that our fathers and we have not been able to bear? Why would we do that? And Paul's going to say in Galatians, what's he say? He says about the Jews, he says, listen, they don't keep the law either. Jews aren't keeping the law. The ones who, who are coming in secretly and want to get you circumcised so they can boast in your flesh, they don't keep the law either. They can't keep the law. Nobody can fulfill the law. It's a yoke that no one can bear. Peter says this. Peter stands up for the Gentiles, so to speak. All right. More of an alternative motive for them, too. Yeah. For them to boast. Yeah, exactly. Amen. Now, taking all that with us back in our heads, okay, back to Galatians. Now, look what happens right after this, by the way, okay? As far as the timeline, as far as I can tell, this happened quickly. Peter just said all that, right? Peter is heroic again. I'll go and die with you, Lord Jesus. And then what happens? Verse 11, but when Cephas came to Antioch, so listen, I went and saw him in Jerusalem. But when he came to visit me, what happened? I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came back, when he came, they drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Now, if we, we, we didn't read this far earlier in chapter 10, but if we got to verse 11, uh, chapter 11, verse 3, Peter was actually eating with the Gentiles in that chapter. And some of the Jews, the circumcision party, the ones who were saying, whoa, hold on a second, you know, we got to tell them to keep the law and everything. You, they say, you actually went to their home and ate with them? Are you kidding me, Peter? And he says, yeah, let me tell you about the revelation I received from the Lord. He says, don't call unclean what I've called clean. Peter's, he's on board, right? He's on board. So Paul says, look, I went up 14 years later and we were running the same course parallel, side by side. That's what he said about Jesus, too. Yeah. With the tax collectors. And Eating with tax collectors and sinners, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Parallel there for sure. And now, here we go, had to oppose him publicly to his face in front of everybody. Why? Because when certain men came from James, these certain men are those who were preaching that you had to keep the law the dietary restrictions and the holiness code and circumcision. You need to add these things to your faith in Christ or you cannot be saved. Christ's blood is not enough. What happened? Peter drew back, separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. Paul says in verse 10, chapter 1, verse 10, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God, or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. I would not be a servant of Christ. Paul is not preaching a message that pleases man. Even Peter, the apostle who had received this revelation, who was running side by side, parallel with the apostle Paul, who just however many days before was defending the Gentiles, eating with Gentiles, fear of man creeps in. And he embraces a distorted gospel. He denies Christ again. Three times before the cock crowed wasn't enough. Here's a fourth time for you. He denies Christ. Functionally denies Christ. Distorts the gospel. Paul says, when I saw, verse 14, that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. Friends, our lives, our lives tell a story. You know that? You know that, right? So in Romans 1, verse 18 says that, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men who in their unrighteousness do what? Suppress the truth, right? Now, what's the problem there with suppressing the truth? Well, the problem is that God is painting His glory in the heavens every day. The heavens declare the glory of the Lord. The earth proclaims His handiwork. Day to day, pours out speech, right? God is putting His glory on display in the created universe and in and through us, His children. And when we don't live in step with the gospel, our lives are proclaiming falsehood about God, right? We're suppressing the truth, not just in our hearts, but in the world. Every sin you commit, right? We said the heart of every sin is gospel and belief. So every sin you commit, you're saying to the world and the watching world and those around you, the gospel is distorted. Christ cannot save. Christ is not a supreme treasure. He's not worthy of my worship. 
right? He's not trustworthy. You're telling some lie about Christ. Very serious. Paul sees that. So when he sees that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, that's why he says, I said to see if it's before them all, because Peter's action had led others to do the same, right? Verse 13, he says, the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically, so that even Barnabas was led astray. And we'll look at that in just a second. But he's publicly doing this. His life is saying something. And he says, before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile, not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Now, the content, like I said, I believe the rest of, of chapter 2 is still his response to Peter. We're going to look at that next week because there's a lot of rich doctrine in there. So I don't want us to get sidetracked here from what we're talking about this evening. But friends, we have to consider, are our lives in step with the gospel? Are we living in step with the gospel? Are we preaching with our lives to ourselves, to other people, to the watching world, a gospel that is seeking the approval of man or of God? Are we seeking to please man, including, most importantly, that one in the mirror, or God? Because again, this gospel, there's no boast in this gospel for you and for me. There's nothing to boast in here. That's why the cross is an offense. That's why. And we can very quickly become like Peter. And, you know, Peter, he gets a bad rap. Poor guy. He's, he's bumbled around. But even for the sake of time, I'll just I'll reference a few things about Barnabas. In Acts 4, Barnabas is called the son of encouragement. He's a Levite. He sold a field right before Ananias and Sapphira, you know, sell a field, and they lie about the, how much they gave to them. They hold back some of the proceeds, which they didn't have to give them anything. But they were doing it. Why? Boasting. Mm -hmm. Look at me. Look what I did. Well, Barnabas, he sells a field too right before them, and he lays all the proceeds at the feet of the disciples or the apostles. Uh, uh, we already saw that Barnabas was the one who defended Paul and brought him before the apostles when they all thought that he was lying and, you know, he wasn't really a convert now. And in Acts 11, he was called a good man full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. He was sent out in Acts 13 with Paul as missionaries. And in multiple places, when you think like, oh, we're reading, I'm reading the story about Paul. No, it says Paul and Barnabas. Sometimes it actually says Barnabas and Paul. And then says they, they spoke out. They preached the gospel. They strengthened the souls of the disciples. They appointed elders. This is no ordinary dude, right? He wasn't an apostle, but he's very eminent in the early church and founding and forming the early church. And in 1 Corinthians 9, 3, Paul says, Is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? You remember how Paul, amongst the Corinthians, so that they couldn't accuse him of trying to get their money from them? He was actually being supported by other churches rather than getting support from the church of Corinth. And he was working, doing tent making for a living. And he says, yeah, Barnabas was right there with me. He refused to refrain from working because he didn't want that to be an obstacle to the gospel going forward. This is an eminent guy. And yet, he says, even Barnabas, even Barnabas acted hypocritically. Even Barnabas was led astray by the hypocrisy of Peter. Brothers and sisters, again, if Peter, the apostle, the rock, and Barnabas, this good man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, who helped establish the early church side by side with the Apostle Paul, if these two men can be found guilty of distorting the gospel with their lives through gospel unbelief, then you and I do as well. Right? We do as well. And we just, we just have to continue to walk through this book and pray that God would open our eyes to that and allow us to see it. Mm -hmm. Why? Why so important? Because if we're not, we're seeking to please man. The world that watches, but this man, right? The one inside of us, our sin, our old man, our flesh. We're seeking to please him by adapting just slightly, distorting just ever so slightly. We distort the gospel so that we can still have something to boast in. Christ won't have it. He won't have it. And that's why Paul so boldly is defending his ministry and saying, listen, I'm not here to please any man. Barnabas, my best friend on the planet, don't care. Peter, rock. You see all the language of they seem to be pillars. I don't care. I don't care if it's an angel from heaven. 
comes to you and preaches another gospel, let him be accursed. My only concern in life is to keep this gospel pure for your sake and for the glory of Christ. We need to have that mentality. We need that mentality. And the way to have that mentality is, again, to see our need, but then see Christ meet our need. Again, we said last week, Peter doesn't stop becoming the apostle, right? He doesn't lose his apostleship. Paul doesn't be like, all right, bye, bye Barnabas, I'm done with you. You can't come on any more missionary journeys with me. No, they repent. They turn to Christ and they receive forgiveness, not based on some works. They don't like try to work their way up to curry some favor with God and with man to try to, no, not at all. Just turn to Christ, flee to Christ, and trust in an unadulterated gospel. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to your cross I cling. Naked, come to thee for dress. Helpless, look to thee for grace. Foul, to the fountain I fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. That's the cry of every Christian, right? And we want our profession of faith to be unmixed. Unmixed, brothers and sisters. We want to be clinging to Christ. Again, what's the purpose of the book? 6, 14. Set your eyes on it again. Far be it from me. Far be it from me. Put it far away, brothers and sisters. May it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world, for neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. So that's our prayer. That's my prayer for you. That's Paul's prayer for you, for us all. And so next week, with a sense of the seriousness with which Paul is addressing his concerns and these topics and the rest of this book, we're going to come and we're going to consider what it looks like when we really start to mix law and gospel. We start to mix law and gospel, some bad things happen makes a mess of your life, an absolute mess. Spiritually, just makes a mess, makes a mess of relationships, makes a mess of everything. We must not mix law with gospel. They must be kept distinct and divided from one another, okay, so that they can do the things God designed them to do. The law to reveal your need for Christ, the gospel to reveal Christ to you. I heard somebody say, the law says do, and the gospel says don't. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I forget which old dead guy had originally said that. Yeah. Where um I think it was Bunyan, run John run, the law demands, get gives neither feet nor hands. Better news or sweeter news the gospel brings. It bids me fly and gives me wings. I remember John Kennedy when she said that um, if you forget nothing to your salvation except the sin that made possible. Yes. Yeah, you didn't hear that. You contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. We are so blessed. Mm. I think to read the Bible is a book. Mm. You can't just read it and put it aside. It's a book that speaks to you every single day. And you need to read it. I, I'm very fond of the verses from John. So, God loved him so loved the world hmm. that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. God did not send his Son into the world to condemn it, but to save it. Hmm. I think that to myself every single day, because I think it helps me to realize. We have a loving, forgiving God. Mm. And that's what we have to remember. Yeah. So, Amen. Not only to have a loving, forgiving God. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. When you think about the joy that should be ours, right? The joy that should be ours. You don't always experience it, you know? But objectively, Peter says that we have a joy inexpressible and filled with glory. We don't always experience the filled with glory part. <laughs> you know, a lot of times where we don't live in light of the joy that we have. But objectively, there's no reason, no reason that we should not have joy.
former pastor and friend of mine, he would always say, if you're having a bad day, just go, what, what changed today? What happened? Why are you miserable? Like, did Christ fall off the throne? You found out, like, the gospel's not real? You know, like, the love of God isn't for you? Like, what did you learn today that actually means something that would put you in such a, you know, such a mood? And it's like, oof, yeah, okay, that's convicting. We have every reason to just rejoice. You know, in, in reading this and, and listening to you read it, a lot of us would say, I wouldn't have done what Peter did. Yeah. <laughs> all of us would have done what Peter did. So the truth is that we're worse than him. Yeah. People aren't follow, following us around and dictating every word we say like he has with the scribes. Mm. Mm. But if there was to be right now a book of each and every oh. one of us, it would be pretty embarrassing. Yeah. God does not ask us to be perfect. He asks us to believe in his son who mm -hmm. makes us perfect. That's right. Now the law demands you be perfect, right? And that's why we can't mix the law with the gospel. Mm. You cannot mix the two. But I also thank God for the the church that you know, Paul was God sent Paul yeah. to correct, mm. you know, what he was struggling with, you know. Yeah. And he was able to encourage him and point him back to the right thinking. Yeah. You know, and that was just not only to preserve the gospel, but to build up his brother, you know, just yeah. like we need church family. Yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, again, Paul, we talked about briefly his view of himself, but, you know, sometimes it's helpful just to see, like, Paul in 2 Corinthians, he says this, in chapter 1, verse 8 of 2 Corinthians, don't want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. We were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Now, he's not talking about being burdened beyond his physical strength there. I mean, sure, there's some, you know, if he's being beaten, whatever, there might be some of that in there. But just beyond his strength, like, I couldn't, couldn't go on. I just felt like I just despaired of life, of living anymore. That's how desperate he was. You know, that, that's, our, that's the apostle. You know, these were just men. You know, Peter, fishermen. Paul, very educated guy, you know, but just a guy. Sinful, just like us, same nature as ours, you know. Did David ever feel like that? What's that? Did David ever feel like that? Oh, yeah, man. I mean, was, he didn't know himself quite so well until the thing with Bathsheba happened, and then he found out real quick. Yeah. Yeah, read Psalm 51 of, you know, against you and you only have I sinned, you know, my sin is ever before me. And knowing that God alone is the only one could reach his bones and make him as yep. pure as he was. Yeah. Again, every time we read the scripture, you see a, a bad example. That's you. Amen. You're not the hero. The heroes are shadows of Christ. They're pointing to Christ, right? The, the villains are pointing to you. But just remember this week, as you're continuing to read through Galatians, start to pray. We've seen, what, we've seen what the situation is, right? We haven't looked too much at details. Last week I gave a couple examples just to give some ideas of areas, ways, you know, broad categories, ways that we mix the law and the gospel and some of the effects of that in our lives, some evidence of that in your life, you know. Um, we're going to see that unfold more and more. But just pray, Lord, just show me, show me areas in my life where I'm mixing the law and the gospel together, where I have a distorted gospel Again, these are not things that you're like, you know, going to, you're not standing up in church and trying to teach people, right? We're not explicitly doing this. We know the gospel. I said last week, we're gospel people. I mean, you're at Grace, you hear the gospel every week in multiple capacities throughout the whole liturgy of the service is focused around the gospel. We know the nuts and bolts of it, but man, still so much unbelief day to day. So just pray, Lord, show me that as I'm reading through this book. Let me see that in my heart, um, because I think the more that it's uncovered, you know, the, the more clearly we can fight it, right? But if you don't know what your flesh is doing, like we said last week, I mentioned we had the flesh, and we also talked about the, uh, the world is against us. Kevin brought up the devil is against us, okay? We have these enemies of our souls. Now, if you have an enemy right now, wouldn't it be really nice to know what your enemy's up to? Like, what does your enemy do? What are the weapons your enemy has? What's its plan? You know, if I said there's somebody coming for you tonight, 
you might just assume it's probably, you know, it's, they're coming with a gun or something, whatever. But like, I don't know if we said like, you know, this nation is coming against us. We probably think of like Russia or something like that. Well, what if it's some tribal nation? They're coming with spears. You know, like, I don't know, maybe they're coming across some boats from some little remote island somewhere and they're coming and they're going to attack America. And we're like, okay, well, we don't need the guns. Like, you know, you want to know, like, what are, do we need shields or maybe they're really advanced? And it's like, listen, you can have all the guns you want. You need something, you know, yeah. you need, yeah, maybe it's bio, you know, bioterrorism or, you know, chemical warfare or whatever. Right. It'd be really nice to know so you could be prepared and, and actually defend yourself and maybe even be on the offensive. You knew something about the enemy, what the enemy does. So we're going to see a lot of that in this book. What is the flesh and the world and the devil, but especially your flesh? What is it doing? What is it doing? It's out to mix law and gospel in you. That's what it's trying to do, it's trying to bring you back under law. And so we're going to see that more and more. So just pray, Lord, start to reveal that to me. And keep my eyes open and my ears open to what your law says about me so that I can see Christ as a beautiful Savior. Jimmy, yeah, would you close us in prayer? I would love to. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all the gifts that you've given us. You've given us, showered us with gifts and how many things we've passed by today and not truly stopped and thank you for what you do for us. Father, thank you for this fellowship right now of your perfect word. Let's not leave here forgetting what we just shared with each other but let's think of a way that we could share it with people who don't know christ mm. uh, father teach us to be more like christ let's stay upright for his word you 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 are enough father you are our fill our cups runneth over mm. with you father thank you for bringing us to christ we did absolutely nothing we did the opposite of what we should have done and father we sit here humble but knowing that you love us Father, please let these prayers be heard in your blessed Son, Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you.